introduce the three major paradigms in sociology. The first paradigm we will be reviewing is called functionalism. A key to helping you understand and remember the definition of each paradigm is by looking at the root of the word. Functionalism examines the function or purpose of things in our society. Functionalism is a macro sociological perspective, meaning it helps us understand the social world, such as systems, organizations, processes, etc. We are trying to understand how everything is interrelated and has a purpose to help us create and sustain our society. One example often used to explain functionalism is the human body. There are different parts of the human body that work together to help create and sustain life. Society works the same way. We have different things in society that help us develop, sustain, and progress. When examining functionalism, we create something or make a decision about something, and the results are either expected or unexpected. When discussing functionalism or talking about the function or purpose of something in society, for example, the idea of war, when we go to war for a specific cause and the outcome results in achieving our goal, then it is considered a manifest function, meaning the result was expected and it occurred the way we imagined it would when we made the decision or created a tool for a specific purpose. In functionalism, we also have latent dysfunctions. A latent dysfunction occurs when we have an unexpected outcome. We may have made a decision to go to war for a specific goal and never have achieved that goal. Sometimes that's the idea of spreading democracy. We can assist a country by going to war to spread democracy. And in the end, the result does not turn out the way we expect it to. And we have different types and forms of governments rising other than a democratic one. That would be a latent dysfunction. It didn't happen the way we thought. It does not necessarily mean that it's dysfunctional in society. It can be, but it does mean it didn't happen the way we intended it to. I also use a real simple example to explain this to students. I sometimes use an example of a chair. We create a chair. The general purpose of a chair is to sit in, and that would be a manifest function. We are using it the way it was intended or expected. But sometimes we use a chair to stand on to change a light bulb, or sometimes when we get angry, we might throw a chair at somebody. That would be a latent dysfunction. We are using it in a way that was unexpected. The next paradigm we will be looking at is conflict theory. Conflict theory is very similar to functionalism and the fact that it is a macro perspective. It is a macro sociological perspective, meaning it also focuses on the social world, such as organizations, systems, processes, etc. What conflict theory is looking at is a struggle over resources. Students often remember this as a power struggle. One of the main examples we use when we talk about conflict theory is those who have power in resources versus those that do not have them. And we call them the have-nots. It's important when looking through a conflict perspective that we are looking at who has power and who does not have power and what it is that gives people the power they have. In some situation, haves are not always equated with power in terms of money. A lot of times we like to use money as an example because it's easy to see. But in some relationships between social groups, it's not always money that is the resource. Sometimes the haves, their resource is status. It could be social status in society that gives power. An example I like to use is parents versus children. Parents, if we look legally in our social world, are the haves because they have all the power and resources to make decisions for their children. So in the case of parents, this would, they would be the haves and the children would be the have-nots. However, if we look at the social relationships between parents and children, children have the power because when they are young, they control a lot of what a family gets to do and not do based on what their needs are. In that relationship, the children would be the haves and the parents would be the have-nots. That is, just socially. Legally, parents are the haves. The last perspective I'm going to review is symbolic interactionism. Some sociologists have shortened 
and how they refer to this paradigm, calling it interactionism. If you look at the root word, symbolic interactionism looks at symbols and interactions. Symbolic interactionism is a micro perspective. It is a micro sociological perspective, meaning it helps us understand the thinking and behavior of people. If we look at the term itself, we are trying to understand how symbols have meaning through interaction. We are actually examining the meaning behind thinking and behavior. One way I help students identify and understand this perspective is saying you can look at the words we use in society because words are symbolic and you can look at physical symbols to help understand the interactions we have with each other. I always write this one in a formula because it's easy to remember. If you have words plus symbol, they equal our meaning or understanding of them in our interactions. Think of the term dog. I always like to say, when I'm at school, my dog is lying on the couch. Then I ask students to describe me dog. What does my dog look like? And I get responses like the image of here. It has a tail, it's furry, it has two ears, and it has whiskers. They have different images of what the dog is, but describe the general term they think I'm referring to which is dog, the animal, or pet. But then I say no, I mean dog, D-A-W-G. Now students are able to create a whole new image of what I was referring to. They can now apply meaning based on the symbol I gave them because this dog, D-A-W-G, is a person. It's a homie or friend. That's a good way to think of symbolic interactionism. When you look at the roots of words, we are looking at how symbols apply meaning in our interactions. This concludes our review of the three major paradigms in sociology. Next time, I'll be evaluating the emerging paradigms. Ta-ta for now.